Hi, I'm Tabitha Coleman, and today I'm interviewing Jazz Coleman, lead singer of Killing Joke, and amongst other things, composer in residence of Prague Symphony Orchestra and composer in residence of the European Union. And apart from this, he's my dad. Hi. Hello, Mr. Jazz <laughs> Coleman. <laughs> Kia ora. Now, Mr. Coleman, you're coming up to your 30th anniversary in Killing Joke. What are your plans for this year? Well, <clears throat> I'm leaving uh, Aotearoa tomorrow and uh, then I'm going to like two months of hard training with my trainer, then it's a world tour. We're killing joke for about three months. Uh, we won't be coming here. <laughs> then uh, I record a new album with Killing Joke, which we're doing it uh, all over the world, Costa Rica, Iceland, a few other places. And then I, uh, we're gonna complete the tour by promoting a new album next year, uh, finishing at Wembley Stadium which is uh, Excellent. good. Excellent. And also, at the end of next year, I'm doing the proms at the Royal Albert Hall, which I'm pretty excited about. That's my other career. Fantastic. Now, could you describe homesickness for me? Homesickness, yeah. <laughs> uh, homesickness is, starts when I leave New Zealand, when I realise um, that when I am leaving New Zealand, well, I'm so far away from New Zealand, I might not come back. Anything can happen. And so you really feel the distance when you live, live the other side of the world. Mm. Uh, I kind of compartmentalise my emotions by sort of shutting out New Zealand yeah. when I leave here. And normally for the first two hours on the flight, I go through all sorts of emotions and what have you. And then I compartmentalise New Zealand into a little block and stash it away. And then, of course, all these feelings about New Zealand come out when I hear a Māori voice, for example, mm. uh, a voice like Hinnies. Um, or if I look at photographs of my daughters, I realise I'm missing out on so much over here. And all sorts of things come up and I realise about the lifestyle and the fishing and all the good things in this country that I'm kind of missing out on. And uh, yeah, and I feel the distance then. Homesickness, oh, yeah. my home is in New Zealand. Now, you've been away from New Zealand for two years now. What changes have you seen? Mm, that's interesting. Well, one of the, the most depressing trends that I've seen is 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 seventy five percent of uh, New Zealand businesses, new New Zealand businesses, go under. Mm. Uh, and I can't. This is really depressing news. And the fact that tourism in New Zealand, which affects everybody, tourism's mm. down by thirty percent in New Zealand, and probably next year it's going to be down by fifty percent. And the reason for this is that. Uh, for every barrel of oil that we're digging up, we're using three barrels of oil. So you can, it, the way this affects New Zealand is, is massive, because if you can think that at the moment, to fly to economy class to the UK is about three and a half thousand uh, New Zealand dollars. Mm. That's going to be six and a half thousand in 24 months time. Mm. If you think that import and export uh, are going to be affected uh, it's not going to be worth importing and exporting stuff because of the f fuel prices. So uh, these are kind of depressing trends. Um, I'd like to see the government of the day offering incentives to young Jack the lads who leave school uh, and employ their friends. I'd like to see these kind of businesses uh, go for three years being tax exempt. Right. You know, I'd like yeah. to see programs like this. I think that everybody should grow vegetables in their gardens and uh, there should be more emphasis on food production in the country. Mm. And when we look at the music industry, <coughs> the age of CDs is finished. It's gone. So most bands, they just put out a CD and they're hoping to make money. This is no good. We have to think of new schemes, new packages. Let me give you an example. Um, a friend of mine, Trent Reznor, he's just done 3,000 3, limited edition of a multimedia package with his new album in. And he sold these for 300 US dollars each. Now, that means that Nine Inch Nails has sold 3,000 records and they've made more than if they'd sold 2 million records to a major label. Now, that's a sobering thought when you think that a lot of New Zealand artists, they think, well, you know, I've sold 5,000 records mm. or 10,000 records. But 5,000 records, cutting out the middleman, you're making half a million half a million English pounds with the sales of 5,000 records. So I want you to think about this new marketing idea of multimedia package. So you've got a book about the artist's philosophy in it. So you've got a CD uh, of the new 
of the new album, but you've also got a DVD in there and also maybe a bit of Greenstone or whatever else you want to put in there. And we sell these packages and uh, this is the way forward. And I want to bring some of these new ideas into New Zealand to bring them up to date to the 21st century. Excellent. <laughs> and could you highlight the milestones in your career for me? The milestones, well, mm. yeah, yeah, well, over 30 years. Mm. Starting from age sort of 16, 17. Well, by the, you know, like my daughters, I was a precocious little git. By the time I was um, 16, I'd already got three in international awards for classical music and uh, blah, blah, blah. I was well on the way to having a musical career, but my parents didn't foresee Killing Joke, of course. Right. Uh, the first mile, I think Milestones, Johnny Rotten in 1978, or uh, of the Pistols, he, he was the first guy who came on board and said, I love this band, Killing Joke. That was the first one, and then Mr. John Peel, rest his soul, um, he, he, he came on board and we, we've got uh, the Peel session of all times, we won this award as well. Other highlights, uh, recording in the great, inside the Great Pyramid in Egypt, I mean that was yeah. just amazing. I can remember coming out of the Great Pyramid and there was about three to four hundred Bedouins and they were all playing drums and clapping when we came out of the Great Pyramid after yeah. recording, and that was just absolutely mind blowing. And that, of course, is going to be in the new Killing Joke movie, which is a New Zealand-funded project, which is also there to celebrate our 30th anniversary. Other milestones, uh, working with two albums with Nigel Kennedy, my mm -hmm. great friend, um, uh, working with Sarah Brightman. Um, what else? Oh, yeah, 2006, I did my first premiere at the Royal Albert Hall. Mm -hmm. In 2001, I was commissioned by the Queen for my first opera at the Royal Opera House. Um, then I've three what, top three, top three, top three. Yeah. What moments? Yeah, I go for moments. Milestones, top three. Yeah, it's got to be uh, doing my first opera for the Queen at the Royal uh, at the Royal Opera House yeah. in Covent Garden. Um, I think it was getting Lifetime Achievement Award for Killing Joke at the age of forty-five. Mm. That was pretty good because that's still relatively young in the scheme of things. I'm glad I started early. Uh, also, milestones. <laughs> now, I have to remember the New Zealand input on this because of course, yeah. uh, if I hadn't got the composer in residence position with York and Phil all mm -hmm. those years ago, and also a break with New Zealand Symphony Orchestra, I wouldn't have done 27 classical recordings. Um, and so, New Zealand really was responsible for giving me my first break mm -hmm. uh, with classical music. Um, so, oh yeah, and what can I say? The New Zealand national anthem with Hini. That's got to be the ultimate milestone. Can you tell us about that? What happened there? Oh, oh, oh yeah, well, it just all kind of <laughs> happened. And uh, <laughs> when you hear the New Zealand national anthem and you hear the Māori voice singing mm. God of Nations, um, that was uh, part of um, part of Hini and mm. my efforts to uh, to to kind of culturally state that New Zealand is no longer a, a British colony, but part of Polynesia, culturally. <laughs> Brilliant. And so who's been your favourite artist that you've worked with? You've worked from Mick Jagger to Sarah Brightman. Favourite artist? Let's yeah, say so two top favourite artists. Oh yeah, well, Nigel Kennedy, he, he's, he's your father's um, old drinking buddy. I don't drink anymore, but he used to be my <laughs> drinking buddy. <laughs> and uh, I've done two recordings with him. And I'm recording with the Berlin Philharmonic at the end of the year with Nigel doing my walk and shirt. So, mm. and uh, he's like a spiritual brother to me. What uh, by artist? What do you mean? I mean, do you mean like singers or instrumentalists? We'll go with singers. 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 Yeah. Singers. Yeah. Well, Mick Jagger was pretty hard to beat, and Sarah Bryant was amazing yeah. to work with. But it would have to be Hinawahi. Hinawahi from from Ocean New Zealand. From New Zealand. I'm grown. It, it would have to be with her. You know. Yeah. Um, I have a long history with her. <laughs> I have a long history with this woman, and uh, she must be my favourite artist of all time. Uh, for one reason alone, of all the singers I've ever seen in my entire life, she is the only singer that has reduced people to tears before my very eyes. And mm. uh, I've never seen a singer with this power before. And uh, when I hear her voice, then I really feel homesick. When mm. uh, Henny's voice is the voice of the nation. Lovely. Yeah, and uh, it's a good point that you bring it, well, that, that she's come up in this conversation because um, uh, 
I have to go back to 1991 with my involvement with Hini when I met her through mm. Tangata Records. And then when I opened York Street Recording Studios, uh, Hini was there when we lifted the tapu of the recording studios, which is why York Street Recording Studios is still there to this day, I believe. <laughs> uh, and I remember watching Hini at The Blessing, mm. and when she sang, I'd never ever in my life heard a voice like it because Hini only sings in Māori. I don't think she's ever sung in English. And uh, from this time, I developed this relationship with her and, and trained her up so that she could sing with New Zealand Symphony Orchestra, Auckland Phil and New Zealand String Quartet, which is yeah. what we did. Yeah. And uh, then we decided to do uh, a big album together, which was Oceania. And um, this was an amazing time in my life in New Zealand because I was living in New Zealand at that, at that particular time. Mm. And uh, while we were writing the album for Oceania, I remember getting this phone call from Hini from the hospital mm. saying, there's been, a, there's been a, some terrible uh, problem with a baby being born, Hini Lakatori, mm. and that she's born with... Um, some kind of autism, I didn't know the details, and I said, Hini, move with it, darling. You're going to be our pinup girl for Nordoff Robbins <laughs> music therapy. And because uh, uh, I was working with Nordoff Robbins before this, my managers were involved with the Nordoff Robbins music therapy, yeah. and I said to her, You're going to be our pinup girl. And if we look just down the line now, we're going back 10 years later. Hini has opened two Hini Rakatori music centers mm. for um, disabled children and uh and for music therapy and it it's been mind-blowing mm. this woman just keeps giving and I, I must tell you all that i am so made up that Hini has just been awarded uh the order of uh, the new zealand order of merit i believe mm. i don't know where to address her as dame weenie or uh, but I, uh, she's up there with Dame Kiriti Kanawa now. Right. Uh, what most people in New Zealand don't know about Hini is that she's the biggest selling Māori artist, the biggest. She is up there with Dame Kiri. I mean, I define a Māori artist by someone who speaks and sings only in Māori. And so uh, Hini's worldwide sales, you can look and you can find out for yourself. She is the biggest. Uh, Māori artists in this country and uh, and I've got to say congratulations Hini and the whole country is right behind you you are a shining example to the whole nation and uh, I look forward to recording you with the London Symphony Orchestra later on <laughs> <laughs> now I have to ask you promised my sister and I that you're moving back here to New Zealand mm. what are you gonna do with yourself when you're back here Oh, that's an interesting point. Well, I guess after like 55 recordings, mm. you have to understand that um, I kind of left New Zealand with my daughter's consent. Uh, so, you know, I, I put it to them that I can either stay in New Zealand and uh, teach music or I can go out hunting with my music outside there. Hunting? Uh, you know, it's hunting. Music's right. hunting. You're going out, you hustle the jobs and then you do the record and hopefully it sells something and then you mm. get on to your next one. It's hunting. And uh, with my daughter's consent, I, I went away and, uh, and it's culminated in the proms and all these wonderful things, playing Wembley, headline at Wembley next year. And so I want to come home to New Zealand and my intentions are, they're multiple. I want to get some fishing mm. in, I haven't been fishing for three years. Uh, on the but barrier? Beyond the Great Barrier, the Great barrier. some parties with my daughters. Uh, but <laughs> the most important thing is, is to give back in life. Uh, I think uh, I would like to raise funds for the fundraising bodies of New Zealand because they give me my first break and you know I'm close to semi-retirement now uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's time yeah. to give some uh, it's time to it's time to give give something back so I'd like to work for the funding bodies of New Zealand I'd like to do lectures I'd like to do debates on what is a New Zealand rhythm mm. and I believe this is connected with Māori dam and only with Māori dam so I'd like to do some workshops and start chilling out and taking life easy and overlooking my daughters while they're at university. <laughs> now, you've been involved in a movie. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's called The Death and Resurrection Show. Uh, it, 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 it's a movie that's been shot all over the world. Mm. And I got the idea uh, because I was involved uh, acting in this, this movie called Year of the Devil, in which I played the devil. 
Uh, and this movie got the five best foreign movie uh, awards from Czech Republic, blah de blah. And uh, the idea was in Eastern European film is that there's, that there's, there's no actors. Mm -hmm. If you want a thug, you bring a real life thug in. So um, what I did was uh, I decided instead of having actors, I'd get all the people who have been involved with Killing Joke, mm. from Jimmy Page to John Lydon, to uh, certain members of the Stones, to Dave Grohl, mm. and they're all acting in this movie. Yeah. And uh, we've taken ages uh, filming it, for example, just on one small scene. We needed to get 10 famous people who knew Killing Joke and also had, had UFO experiences. When this took uh, like three or four years to get like at this short list and actually shoot this, you yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, and so the whole movie ends with uh, Killing Joke stipulating that they're going to play at one concert at the year 2012 in New Zealand. In New Zealand. And that's how there the movie ends. Because <laughs> uh, there's a lot of debate about the year 2012, whether we'll all still be here. And I thought the best thing Is that to your own personal debate or is it one you... <laughs> well, uh, th there's a lot of debates about the year 2012. For, right. for a start, any calendars that uh, use the system of precession, mm. uh, they all come to an end on uh, 2012 on December the 22nd. Uh, the Mayan calendar comes to an end. It's the end of the fourth age and the fifth sun. And I thought, well, what better thing to do on the day of complete and utter destruction than to set up a gig in New Zealand? <laughs> so oh, yeah. if we yeah. all survive, well, that's great. Yeah. And if we don't, well, we had a good time. <laughs> okay, can you tell me your two favourite New Zealand products? Oh, yes, I can. Oh, yes, yes, I can. When I get into New Zealand, the first thing I do is, it's a funny thing, isn't I go and buy a pie. Because although the English don't make pies anymore, and the New Zealanders have excelled in the art of, of uh, pie making. So right. uh, I go and get a pie, and then I carry something around with me all the time. Everywhere I go, right away throughout the world, I'll show you here. It's a bottle of Kai Tire <laughs> Fire. Now, this is what I mean about being a New Zealander. Every bar in New Zealand should have Kai Tire Fire <laughs> and not the American equivalent. Because this is being patriotic, you know? Uh, every time you have a Bloody Mary, there should be Kai Tire Fire going into it, and, um, and certainly not the American equivalent, if you get my thinking. Uh, the other thing is uh, Whitaker's Almond Gold. Oh, yes. 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 So that's it, really. Excellent. Now, can you name me, let's say, three of your most embarrassing moments? Three? Without your... Career. I'll, We're gonna limit it. Yeah. I'll give you one. Be here all night, otherwise. Most embarrassing moment. I'll give you one. Okay. Oh, okay. I was um, I was preparing to do uh, a concert at Liverpool Royal Court with Killing Joke, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I dropped you off at, uh, at your school, and I came home before the two of us came outside to pick me up, and I thought, right, I need t-shirts, I need this, this, this. And I couldn't find any like clean underwear, so uh, and I had to. And the tour bus pulled outside, so like I just grabbed a pair of your mother's knickers, oh, no. and uh, uh, and um, <laughs> and uh, uh, whacked them on, and then went to the gig. So we're cut to the gig. If you can imagine, like two and a half thousand people going absolutely crazy, and there I'm at the gig, and then some guy in the audience, he spits because punk. Some people think that's punk, you know. He, he spits and it goes right into my mouth. I went absolutely ballistic. And so I jumped over the orchestra pit and landed right on top of this guy, I went crunch right down on top of him. And then the audience grabbed me and they started pulling me one way. All the roadies went into the orchestra pit and grabbed me and started pulling me the other way. And then I thought I was going to split in half and suddenly you hit this great big rip. And then my ass is, I'm, I'm just being pulled on stage and my bare ass is there in front of two and a half thousand people and lo and behold, there's all my tackle hanging out and uh, your mum's frilly knickers on, can you imagine, you can't embarrass me, yeah. and, and one of these roadies just came round with gaffer tape and gaffer tape me up. <laughs> Jazz, but that's all we have for tonight. Thank you very much it's for your time. It's been a pleasure, darling. Thank you.